Hello there, good afternoon. Uh, it's Mr. Kennedy, and I've got this week's lecture. It's called New Imperialism in the 19th Century, and we're going to be looking at imperialism in India, in Africa, and a little bit in East Asia as well. Now, Europe in the 19th century is going to really change towards the end of the century, right before the 20th century starts. And the last third of the century, roughly the last 25, 30 years, uh, Europe is going to spread its control over more than 10 million square miles of land and over 150 million people. Uh, this is going to be a total of one-fifth of the world's entire land and about 10% of its population. And this new colonization that's going to happen, it's based on the ideas of industrialization, it's based on the ideas of lowering costs, and raising production, um, all based on Western industrial and scientific methods. And there are several reasons that this new imperialism happened. So uh, one of the reasons this new imperialism happens is simply a need for raw materials and a need for new markets. You have things like oil and rubber, cotton, tin, other rare metals are all needed for this period of industrialization. There's a need for control. If you need all these raw materials, it's a lot easier to have complete political control over the area where those raw materials come from. Modernized medicine is going to play a part. There are going to be immunizations developed against typhoid. Uh, they figure out how to rehydrate you if you catch cholera. And Ipecac is going to be discovered to help if you have dysentery. Now, tropical worms are still going to be a problem and tropical protozoa are still going to be a problem. But if you're careful, it's much harder to catch those items. Another reason that this is going to happen is national prestige. Colonization, it drove this excitement and it drove this nationalism and it also gave Europeans this illusion of spreading civilization to other parts of the world. Uh, it's also a diversion from class conflicts. So it's a way to kind of quell the masses in these European countries. There's going to be imperial rivalries. As Great Britain gets a larger and larger empire, Germany is going to want an empire. Russia is going to want an empire. France wants an empire. So there's this real rivalry as to who's going to be the biggest, the best, and strongest in Europe. And it's really important to know overpopulation is absolutely not a reason. Most Europeans who emigrate from Europe are going to go to North and South America or Australia. They don't go to India. They don't go to Africa. So overpopulation has nothing to do with why Europeans take over places in Africa. Now for a moment, I want you to pay attention to these two political cartoons here. I believe I've said it before, but if not, I'm going to say it now. Political cartoons can really give you great insight into what's going on in the world at any particular time. So the political cartoon on the left, you can see these European powers, Russia, Britain, and Germany, just kind of grabbing parts of the globe and putting it into their, their bag. And then on the right, you can see where this person who's supposed to represent England has arms like an octopus trying to touch as much of the world at once as they can. Now let's start with British India. Around, well actually in 1600, Queen Elizabeth I is going to charter a company known as the English East India Company. And the English East India Company, its goal, its job is to compete with the Dutch East India Company in the spice trade. The Dutch East India Company is going to win the English East India Company cannot keep up 
And the English East India Company is going to focus its attention on India because it feels like it can be the top trading company there. So the English East India Company is going to gain trading rights in the city of Madras, in the city of Bombay, and the city of Calcutta. And by 1647, roughly 50 years after this company is founded, the English East India Company is going to have a total of 27 trading posts up and down the coast of India where only they can do business. The Mughal Empire that we've talked about in a previous lecture, it's going to fall apart around 1700. And fighting is going to break out between Muslims and Hindus throughout India for control. This is where Great Britain and France are going to get even more involved. Uh, Great Britain and the East India Company are going to support the Hindus. France is going to support the Muslims. And a war is going to break out. In fact, in 1751, a British force led by Robert Clive, who is an employee of the English East India Company, is going to lead a combination British Hindu force that defeats a Muslim French force near the city of Madras. And Robert Clive, along with the English East India Company, is going to get control over that region. Five years later, the Seven Years' War breaks out, and the Seven Years' War is the first global war, which means part of the fighting of the Seven Years' War happens in Europe, part of it happens in North America, and yes, part of it happens in India. A French-supported Muslim prince is going to capture the city of Calcutta. 146 British civilians are going to be kept in a dungeon overnight. And this becomes known as the Black Hole of Calcutta because by the next morning, only 23 prisoners are alive. The other 123 British civilians are dead. In response to this mass murder, Robert Clive is going to lead a force of 3,000 British and Sepoys, meaning uh, local Indian soldiers, to recapture the city of Calcutta. And then this force of 3,000 British and Sepoy soldiers is going to go on and defeat an army of 50,000 French Muslims at the Battle of Plassey. As we know from talking previously, France loses the Seven Years' War. The Treaty of Paris 1763 is where the, the uh, peace treaty is signed. And not only does France have to give up all of its territory in North America, but in the Treaty of Paris 1763, France also has to give up all of its claims to India. So there's only one country left in India. That is going to be England or Great Britain. But it's not Great Britain itself that has power. It is literally the English East India Trading Company that has control of India. It would be like if Microsoft had control of, I don't know, Costa Rica or something like that. It's this one country or this one company that's ruling over an entire colony. Now, Robert Clive is going to be named the first governor of Calcutta by the East India Company. And this happens right after the Treaty of Paris is signed. Now, Robert Clive, his primary goal is to end illegal profits being made by company workers on the black market. At the time, people were selling food supplies to Indians uh, at prices that were so high that they couldn't pay them. And often the local Indian population would die of starvation. It's not until 1773 that Parliament passed a regulation act that gave the East India Company a loan to stay afloat in exchange for some say over what happens in India. But it's important to know that India is still a colony of the English India Company. It's not until the, the India Act of 1784 that the government of Great Britain gets full responsibility for Indian affairs. 
basically up until this time, up until 1784, the East India Company was running its own government. It was completely in charge of what was happening in India. But 1784, that changes. The government of Great Britain takes full responsibility for what's going on in the colony of India, and Lord Cornwallis is named the first governor general. Now, if you've heard the name Lord Cornwallis before, you're not imagining things. Lord Cornwallis, before he became the governor general of India, he was the head of the British North American colonies. Lord Cornwallis is the person that was defeated by George Washington at the Battle of Yorktown. So Lord Cornwallis becomes the first governor general in India and he's going to set up a British style court system and he's going to set up a British style civil service. Only a few educated Indians are allowed to pass these tests and only a few educated Indians are allowed into the civil service. It's very much going to be a British run government. In 1795, Lord, Lord Cornwallis, he's replaced by a guy named Richard Wellesley as governor general. And under Richard Wellesley, the British land holdings are going to be doubled and a lot of this land is going to be taken away uh, illegal or illegally, I should say. The government under which, uh, Richard Wellesley is going to begin to rewrite Indian customs. Um, the population of India is going to be forced to attend British style schools. There's going to be the abolishment of sati. And if you don't know what sati is, perfectly fine. Um, it's not something that we hear about a lot these days. But in traditional Indian customs, the widow was expected to throw herself on her husband's funeral pyre. So as the husband's body is being cremated, the remaining widow was supposed to throw herself on that fire. That way her and her husband could live together in all eternity. The British got rid of that. The British are also going to get rid of the caste system that had existed for thousands of years at that point. And it's going to be legal for the first time for widows to remarry. Normally widows aren't widows because they kill themselves, but now widows can't do that and they're going to be allowed to remarry. Next big event is called the Sepoy Rebellion. In 1857, the British are going to introduce a new type of gun known as the Enfield Rifle. And this gun required soldiers to bite off the top of a greased cartridge to load the rifle. Well, rumors spread that the cartridges were smeared with both beef and pork grease. Uh, of course, Hindus can't touch beef or cows. Hindus can't ingest beef. And then Muslims, they can't ingest pork and they're not supposed to touch pigs. Well, here we have a rumor that says these cartridges have both pig and pork grease and everybody gets angry. The Sepoy soldiers, once again, that means the native Indian soldiers, they're going to refuse to load their rifles due to the grease. And some of these soldiers are going to be dismissed from the army and others are going to be sent to prison. Well, on May 10th of 1857, three divisions of the Indian army near the city of Delhi are going to revolt against their British commanders. The members of this mutiny are going to free the Sepoy prisoners who have been sent to jail because they won't bite the tops off these cartridges. They're going to march to the city of Delhi. They're going to kick out the British government and they're going to install a Mughal emperor. Near the city of Lucknow, a group of 400 British men and women and children are going to be promised safe passage out of the city, but they're instead massacred and only four of the 400 citizens survive. Those four are going to go on to tell the tale. Uh, this rebellion, this Sepoy rebellion, uh, it's going to take the British more than a year to bring to an end. It is a long, long 12 months for the British to get control of the Indian colony again. After the 
Sepoy Rebellion is quashed. Um, in 1858, the Parliament of Britain is going to pass something known as an Act for the Better Government of India. The Act for the Better Government of India is going to abolish the East India Company and any and all rights to the to governing India will pass to Great Britain. So the Governor General is now going to be replaced by a Viceroy. The Viceroy will only answer to Parliament, nobody else. Parliament also began to return any stolen land that was previously uh, taken by Richard Wellesley and return it to local ownership. Uh, one exception though is if there is no longer a living heir, then the government would keep that land. Now all total, there were 560 different states and principalities throughout India. Uh, these 560 states and principalities were all controlled by local princes, but all of these local princes had different treaties and different foreign affairs, all controlled by the British government. So in other words, these 560 different states and principalities, even though in theory they have a local prince, in theory they have local control, they really don't. And, by the way, the Viceroy could replace these princes at will, whenever he wanted to. Now, Western inventions are going to be put into place, such as the railroad and telegraph. Uh, a British-style postal service is going to be created. British-style schools are still going to be used. British-style universities are going to be built and opened. And the government of Great Britain is going to do their best to modernize India in their image. All right, next section is called the Scramble for Africa. But before I do that, um, I'm going to give you another chance at some extra credit. The work for this lecture is due Monday night, the 15th at 11.59 p.m. If you send me an email by Monday night at 11.59 p.m. saying that you watched this video, then I will take whatever your lowest quiz grade is right now and make it 100. So if you have a quiz where you've gotten a zero, all you have to do is email me saying, Mr. Kennedy, I watched your video between now and 11.59 p.m. on Monday the 15th. And if I get that email in time, you're going to get 100 on one of your quizzes. That is a reward for watching my videos and taking time to attend a lecture even though we're not actually meeting in person. All right, so the scramble for Africa. It all comes down to the Berlin Conference, which you have to read a little bit about. And it's really important to know, in 1875, Europe controlled less than 10% of Africa. But by the year 1900, just 25 years later, European powers controlled more than 90% of Africa. In reality, only Liberia and Ethiopia remain independent and when we get into World War I, World War II, even Ethiopia is going to fall under European control. Now, Africa is seen as an economic gold mine because of its rare metals, its scarce minerals, diamonds, rubber, and coffee. And so it's really going to be um, a place that European powers want to control because they need all these raw materials. In 1884, the new German Empire is going to call the Berlin Conference, where they talk about what to do with Africa. And it resulted in something known as the General Act of the Berlin Conference. And this is what kicks off the scramble for Africa. Now, this General Act of the Berlin Conference, it stated that a European power could acquire rights over colonial lands only if they had effective occupation, treaties with local leaders, 
flew their national flag and establish a government. In other words, it wasn't just enough to plant a flag and say that some land belonged to Europe. But these European countries had to go there, occupy it with force, get treaties signed with local leaders, and establish a functional government. In other words, European powers had to actually go to their colonies and had to stay there. So as these European countries start getting treaties signed with the local leaders, random lines are drawn on maps of Africa, and Africa is divided up. Um, and really, Africa is divided up at the convenience of European powers. It doesn't matter tribal division. It doesn't matter tribal governments. Um, these European powers are just going to sign treaties with whoever they can and get as much land as possible. So this means that hostile tribes are often thrown together in the same colony. And when colonization ends and these colonies get their independence, that means that these hostile tribes are thrown together in the same country. Um, caste systems are going to create, are going to be created and replace the existing tribal systems. And with these caste systems, you can always guarantee that the European powers are going to be at the top and the local population are going to be all the way at the bottom. This map here shows how this scramble happens. Um, Great Britain, the United Kingdom, goes north-south because they want to build a railroad from basically Alexandria, Virginia to Cape Alexandria, Egypt, not Virginia, Alexandria, Egypt, down to um, Cape Town, South Africa. At the same time, France is trying to go from west to east. Germany gets involved. Germany gets a couple of territories such as German Southwest Africa and Tanzania and Cameroon and even the Congo, which is owned by Belgium, is created and the Congo is going to be something like 90 times the size of what Belgium was. Not only that, but the Congo was originally a colony of one person, King Leopold of Belgium. So hostile tribes are going to be lumped together in the same colony. Uh, Indian and Syrian administrators are going to be imported to run the economies of these colonies. And these Indian and Syrian colonies are going to replace most of the native African administrators. And native Africans are going to be severely limited from these colonial governments. They're going to be purposely left out of these colonial governments. And that's going to cause a lot of problems when these countries start to get their independence because there's no native leaders to step in and fill the vacuum left when the European powers leave. African people throughout the continent are going to be subdued by force. Uh, there's the Herrera Wars in German Southwest Africa. Uh, if you've never heard about them, I highly suggest you, you learn about them because it's just absolutely amazing that the Germans try to wipe out the Herero people. And in many ways, the Germans are going to test out ethnic clean cleansing uh, on the Hereros. And eventually, ethnic cleansing is going to be used against the Jews during the Holocaust. In the Belgian Congo, there are atrocities being uh, undertaken where people are purposely starved, hands are going to be cut off, people are going to be purposely mistreated. And King Leopold actually treats the people of the Belgian Congo so bad that the colony is taken away from him. Great Britain is going to have the Zulu Wars of Southeast Africa and then the Mahdi War in Egypt and Sudan. And both of those wars, the local populations are going to, to be put down harshly and without prejudice. 
Much of the warfare and trouble Africa has experienced since the 1960s can actually be traced back to the scramble for Africa because of all of these reasons. Now, last but not least, I do want to mention Japanese imperialism. Uh, in a, by 1894, Japan's going to be a Western-style powerhouse. It's going to be treated as an equal to the West, and it wants its own empire. Uh, in 1894, Japan is going to defeat China and take over control of Korea. In fact, in the war of 1894 between China and Japan, China fails to win a single battle. After the victory over China, Japan is going to be treated as an ally and an equal by Britain. And the reason Japan is going to treat Britain as an equal is to help keep Russian expansion in check. It's all about um, rivalries and it's all about nationalism. Well, in 1904, Japan and Russia are going to go to war over control of northern China, a part of China known as Manchuria. And Russia had just completed the Trans-Siberian Railroad. It had just built a naval base at the city of Port Arthur. And Russia wasn't happy with that. Russia wanted full control over Manchuria. And Japan was actually okay with that as long as Russia agreed to leave Korea alone. Well, Russia didn't leave Korea alone because Russia thought it was better than Japan, and Russia thought that Japan was still weak and backwards. Well, on February 8th, 1904, the Japanese attack the Russian forces absolutely without warning. The entire Russian Pacific fleet is destroyed. Japan is then going to attack the city of Port Arthur, and 20,000 Russian soldiers die. Oh, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. 20,000 Japanese soldiers die there, but even with these massive losses, the Japanese are still going to win the battle. Uh, the Russian army will be destroyed at the Battle of Mukden, which is you know, a little bit further north into Manchuria. And things get so bad for Russia that Tsar Nicholas II is going to order the Atlantic fleet of Russia to sail around the globe to Japan, and Japan destroys the Atlantic fleet as well. In other words, Russia completely loses its navy to this war with Japan. Um, just to give you an idea how complete the victory of Japan was over the Russian Atlantic fleet, on May 10th, 1905, Russia lost 12,000 sailors to casualties. 6,000 sailors to captivity, and 40 out of 42 Russian ships are destroyed. Uh, Japanese casualties on that day, 117 men and a total of three boats. After defeating both Russia and China, Japan's going to be viewed as a complete and total equal to the, left, to the West. Japan is going to be left alone to build its empire. And Japan is not going to be challenged at all until World War II breaks out in the 1930s. Now, overall, what's the impact of imperialism? Uh, it's really hard to view objectively just due to the subsequent warfare, the hardships, the trauma. Uh, but it does create a period of peace in both Africa and India. So there's some good sides, but there's a lot of downsides to it. Uh, both lands and goods in Africa and India are expropriated for use by European powers. And very little, if any, of the wealth is returned back to these colonies. And more often than not, European countries fail to train the indigenous people to govern themselves or to take over when the European powers leave. So when the European powers leave in the 1950s and 1960s, these power vacuums are created and warfare is going to break out in places like India and Africa. All right, so that's the end of this lecture. I wanna show you one thing here real quick. I'm pulling over the, the weekly calendar. We are right here, we're on chapter 27, week 12. All of this work is due once again by the 15th at 1159 p.m. But then the next week, are going to be the world wars 
and your museum review is going to be due by the 22nd of November. So if you have not yet been to a museum, please start thinking about which museum you want to go to and visit. You really only have two weekends left to do that. Uh, remember, the list of museums is on the syllabus, and if you need any recommendations on a museum, if you're not sure which museum to choose from that list, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, I can help you figure out or narrow down a museum that is of interest to you. Uh, there are very many um, topics you can go see. Very, uh, The museums vary in what they cover. So if you're somebody who likes the Civil War, got a museum. If you like civil rights, got a museum. If you like local history, yep, there's a museum for you there too. And then the last thing I want to mention, December 6th. We're really close to the end of this class, believe it or not. And the final week, December 6th, that's when your SLO essay is due. So if you have not started working on your SLO, if you haven't started doing some research on that, I highly recommend you do that soon. If you haven't looked at the PowerPoint I put up with the SLO pointers, uh, check that out in the SLO folder. And any questions, or if you need any help on the SLO, please email me because I want to make sure that everybody has a chance to get a, a very good grade on this. I want to make sure everybody has a chance to uh, you know, maybe even submit a rough draft if you need me to read something uh, to make sure that you're not plagiarizing or doing anything that you're not supposed to. So I look forward to some emails from you. Thank you for watching and don't forget to register for classes if you are going to be with us next semester and uh, we'll see you around. Have a great day. Bye-bye.